Welcome to another classical music podcast from the Kirov Academy, this time literally from the Kirov Academy. Uh, my guest this afternoon is Professor Irina Morisanu, uh, an internationally renowned, and those words are often thrown around, but they really mean it, an internationally renowned violin superstar, uh, laureate and winner of some of the world's most prestigious competitions, um, somebody that I've known for longer than I care to uh, admit, so with that, please welcome Professor Irina Morsanu. Thank you, Emil. And we're, you should say that we're colleagues because in this, in this profession, we all at some point become, you know, we run, we run into each other in competitions and then that's, that's what it is. We are colleagues and we're all kind of working for the greater good of the violin world, at least. But, but also what, what the, the folks that, uh, watch this, that the parents, the students should realize it's just how small that circle is. And the same person that you ran into last month in Paris, you're going to run into next month in Tokyo. Um, distance means nothing. It meant nothing before Corona. It means less now. Um, and I, I sometimes want to believe that time means nothing because now as I talk to you, part of my brain is back in Brussels in, what was it, 97? Oh, yes, it was. My God, yes. But it feels really like are you there? 10 years ago because what happens after you know after you stop being a student in fact in this profession you never stop being a student right true um but in your after in, at least officially you're not a student anymore then the real fun starts which is you are actually starting to figure out who, who you are as a as a musician? Uh, hopefully, as a as a violinist, you would have figured out by then. <laughs> I don't think so. Well, but that's in some way that's why that's why we were we were doing competitions too. I was I was thinking about that yes. this morning. Why why were we doing competitions? Were they fun? I guess in a skewed sort of way they were. In a kind of adrenaline fueled sort of way. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were very useful because, yes, you're right, this is where you, you will meet your colleagues. This is where you get to know who the people in your generation are. And um, when, when I started doing those international competitions, I was fresh off the boat from Bucharest, Romania. Now, granted, I had done a few competitions before in Europe, so I knew who my colleagues were in Europe. And then I came here to study. Um, I I did a master's degree at the University of Champaign, Illinois, and then I moved to Boston immediately um, in 96. And that's when I realized I didn't, I didn't know anyone here and no one knew me because it's hard for anyone to remember this, but Google did not exist yet. In fact, I always say when I came here, I didn't know anything because it was the pre-Google time when you couldn't just sit down and put in, in the keyword schools of music in the United States. So I knew someone who offered me a scholarship and I just knew that Champaign, Illinois was somewhere close to Chicago. Now, of course, coming from Europe, somewhere close to a city in Europe would be like right. four minutes. kilometers. Exactly. So, um, well, little did I know that somewhere close to Chicago was about two and a half hours. Uh, but anyway, but that's another story. <laughs> and then, and then, yes, I realized that I didn't know my colleagues here. I didn't know schools of music. I didn't know. I did not know what New England Conservatory was. The person that drew my attention to it, Soren Badratuni, who is a cello professor at uh, in. Um, um, East Lansing, um, MSU, Michigan State University, had been an artist diploma at the, at the New England yeah. Conservatory. So when I started looking for schools, then again, I was looking at, <laughs> this sounds so antiquated, um, the big volume of uh, Musical America, the listings of School of Music, and trying to make sense of where would, could I go next after I was done with my master's degree. And uh, Soren Bagratuni said, by the way, have you ever heard of the England Conservatory? I said, no. Do you know they have an, a program called Artist Diploma? You should apply. So I said, yes, I did apply. 
And I remember being backstage auditioning for the artist diploma program at New England Conservatory. And uh, my pianist, they, because they would they would um, actually give you a uh, pianist. You had a, an hour rehearsal and then you were supposed to present uh, an hour program on in Jordan Hall, which is a huge hall. And the pian I asked the pianist, I said, how many people were, um, are, were accepted in this program last year? And she said, one. <laughs> I said, one violinist? She said, no, one instrumentalist. You are competing with everyone. Can you hear me? I mean, we're, yeah. we're having extreme, we're having extreme uh, connection difficulties. Um, so it's fine. On the it's fine. Okay. Um, because Is there something I, I can do? Because I can't hear the, the end of a sentence. Um, let, me, let me ask you this. Because the, the kind of narrow circle that you're describing, um, in Europe, in Romania, how much awareness did you have um, about let's say fellow Romanian violinists versus fellow uh, European violinists versus American violinists. How, how small was your world pre-Google? The world, it was basically relegated to Europe because that was the easiest way to, you know, first of all, that was the landing spot, mo mostly Germany. So most Romanian violinists were in, in, in Germany at that point, Mihaila Martin, um, Sylvia Markovic was and still is in, uh, in you know, France, border with Switzerland, but everyone was in about the same, same area. Um, so very, very few people in Italy, a few people in Spain. I, mean, I, I just remember in... Go ahead. But it seemed... You know, when, when I would go to competitions, they were primarily in Europe. Yes. Um, and people there <clears throat> seemed to know each other, you know, from things other than competitions. I would see, you know, familiar faces in December that I last saw at a competition in September, you know. Um, I, I became aware of a sort of circle of colleagues. Uh, like you were saying, I, I became aware through competitions uh, certainly not through some sort of computer search or anything like that. No. Uh, and after a while, you know whom to fear because you see their name in the you know finalist lists every single time. Um, so you arrive and you see so and so, and you know one spot in the final is reserved. Well, it was the system of um, honing instrumentalist in back then in Romania was kind of the opposite of what we're doing here where everyone has a chance you know everyone is allowed to pursue their musical studies back then um, anyone who was serious about learning an instrument had to go to a place similar to the care of Academy where you would have your uh, general education classes in the morning and um, interspersed with those classes were music theory and music history. And then you would start orchestra and chamber fifth music, grade, exactly, chamber music. And in, in high school, we had harmony, music history, um, aesthetics. Really? So, yeah, right. That's so, a great so, class to have. <laughs> but here's the thing, here's the catch between eighth and ninth grade. So basically before we entered high school, there was a big exam and half of the school was thrown out because was, they were not it was deemed. This Darwinian selection. Yes, they were not deemed yeah. like, you know, people that were, they, they, they couldn't make the cut. They were not deemed to become professional musicians. Um, and similarly, um, at the college entrance, because we would go based basically, um, it's, Again, the, the European system where after high school, you would go straight into medical school or law school or conservatory. So that that exam basically had only spaces for a third of whoever graduated. graduated class. Now you have to think that on 
top of the people that graduated high school, they were the people that hadn't made the cut the previous year and the previous year before that. Uh, the boys had a major problem, which was the army. If you didn't get into college, you had to do you went, a you went to the army. of army. Now, that was pretty much a death sentence. Not, I mean, not death, death sentence, a death sentence as a musician. Death if sentence you, as a musician, exactly. If you don't practice for a year and a half. Or more. How can you possibly compete with the people that just got out of, of high school and they're fresh, you know, like, and they're practiced nine hours a day to get to get to that entrance exam? So, so that is why once people were at the conservatory, it was a very, very small amount. So those people would make the circuit then. Yeah. And because and, of that, we would all know each other because we grew up together. Yeah. So, so it was a very cutthroat system. However, I mean, first of all, the quality was insanely high. The second thing was that everyone was guaranteed a job when, w once they graduated. So, because, because if you didn't, if you were not a, a competition, uh, you know, uh, material, um, orchestras, uh, you know, the, the yeah. circle with whom you had gone to school uh, would form phenomenal, you know, string quartets. Not only that, but but the government was legally they were obliged to give you a job once you would graduate. And, and we should we should make it clear that what you are describing, I am familiar with because of my mother in the Soviet Union. This was not the case necessarily in Italy and France and so forth. You were not guaranteed a job. No. In Italy. But the same sort of system of filtering out the, the people who just were not going to make the cut. Um, as far as I know, it takes place throughout Europe. Yes, yes, and there's still this idea of um, people that that once they, uh, I guess, it's the equivalent of tenure, but it's a little bit um, more widespread. Uh, Middle Italy, for example, I know that you you kind of put your name, and if you qualify, you put your name on a list, and at some point you will get to be a tenured professor, and then you are guaranteed to have a job in a conservatory. Also, a system of, you know, formed already formed progress. You're not inventing your career as you're trying no. to establish your career. Right. So you could say that you know this is, sounds amazing, but then again, the it's opportunity for someone who would be, let's say, and decide they want to become a professional violinist. And my God, you and I have seen so many examples here of. You know, people that did just that, they would yeah. have never had a chance in, you know, in places like Romania or, you know, back then, uh, Russia. So, I mean, there's, there's a trade off. On the one hand, you may be, you know, losing some late developing uh, exceptional talent. Um, on the other hand, uh, as you were telling the story of the, you know, severe selection process, and I'm thinking of my mother telling stories of the, the people who were allowed to go to compete on behalf of the Soviet Union, you had to first win the all-Russian competition, then you had to win the all-Soviet competition in order to be sent out as an official representative of the country. Um, but the flip side of that coin, I was remembering from my own experience, uh, I, will, I will not mention names, I will not even mention the competition, um, but in one competition that I did, a fellow American, um, went and uh, we, we became friendly because I think we were the only two Americans there. He did not make the second round and uh, not, not mentioning names, I'm just gonna say that I, I could see why. Um, but when he was uh, very sad about this, I told him that you know he should go and talk to the jury, uh, which is what I had done in, in this period where I could not make the final round of the competition to save my life between 93 uh, and 97, I could not make a final round. So I told him to go to talk uh, to the jury. Uh, and meanwhile, I had made the, the semifinal, so I, had, I, I was practicing and didn't have mental space to go with him and you know, give him moral support. He came back to the hotel, knocked on my door, and he was like white, you know, like as a sheet. I said, what happened? He said, well, I went and I talked, and he mentioned the name of the juror, and I went, oh, God, because I knew this juror was very strict and, and severe, very honest, but, you know, was not going to be delicate or diplomatic. Sugar coated. Mm. So I said, so what did that jury member say? And he repeated imitating the juror's accent. He said, 
he said, you are a terrible violinist. Have you considered a different profession? And I thought, how cruel. And in, in later months and years, I thought, how kind. You know, because that juror, yes, he could have been supportive and, you know, encouraging and so forth. But he was looking at a 20 something year old player who could not play. What is the kind thing to do then to say, I'm sorry, but do this for fun, do this for self enrichment. But there are people who, you know, uh, can't get a job uh, who are far, far better. And you, you will not be able to find work. Go do something else, you know. Uh, do you feel that when, when you see somebody who is, let's say, 24 years old with extreme technical problems, what do you think is more kind to encourage or to discourage? I think we live in a different world now than, than the world that even, you know, 20 years ago, that sounds like a lot, but it isn't really, um, you know, that that jury member was in the mind of if you couldn't, because this obviously, this is a profession in which you deliver or you don't deliver. If you, you have to, the way I put it, stand, stand on your two, two feet and play the violin well. It, there, there's no excuses. You're not going to go on stage and say, ladies and gentlemen, why do I, you know that my aunt got sick and my dog and it's my music and there's no such thing. You play well or you don't play well. And there's really no falling around pretty much. You know, people will know if you can deliver or not. However, however, and this is where everything changed. I think everything changed the second internet came around. Um, the multitude of, let's just stay with violinists, of violinists that are now on the face of the earth that are winning competitions. Do you feel like you, you read the violin channel and every day there's a new winner of another competition? I do, or at least every week. And that wasn't so much, you know, when you and I did competitions, there were, well, there were, there were fewer competitions. There, there were fewer competitions too. There, exactly. There were not that many competitions. There were not that many violinists. There were maybe there were not that many aspiring violinists. And then also the way you would make a career was it wasn't necessarily one path, but the path was clearer than it is right now. Um, people now make careers by having a big personality. Now, yes, of course, they get they should also be able to play the violin and many of them do but i feel that there's more you know more roads leading to rome than there were when when you and well, i even, even growing up the stories that you know my mother uh, and, and her peers would tell me uh what you're describing was even more extreme we're talking about a world then where if you played in an orchestra, for example, you would never solo again, you know, the, where the, the the sort of class distinctions between, you know, soloist and chamber musician and orchestra player were far less permeable, you know. Uh, exactly. I mean, you see, you see now musicians uh, that have a solo career, but they also uh, become festival organizers or someone who's an orchestra musician, but all of a sudden they are into arts management. Yeah. Um, and, and, and people that become very famous because you know, they have um, amazing YouTube videos. Uh, <laughs> when, when that video of mine went viral with like you know, 2 million views or something, uh, and people are like, aren't you frustrated that you've practiced and labored and worked and the thing that gets all the eyeballs is you playing some Bach major with your son on your arm. I'm like, you think? Yeah, I, I'm a little frustrated. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It got you up there. <laughs> so, so there's 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 that now. So, but back to your question because I, I do want to 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 answer that, and I think my my answer has greatly changed in the last. 20 years, maybe 20 years ago, I would have said, you know, it is my job to maybe point out to someone that if they don't have the chops to have, you know, this much repertoire and do it this well, maybe they don't have a career in music. 
So what has changed? Well, the world has changed as we just discussed, but also my opinion on what my job as a, an educator is, is very different. My mission is to um, hone not only the talent, but the desire of people to make a contribution to the music world. Our numbers are not dwindling, but our presence in the world, at least if we're talking about you know, United States and, and Europe, is dwindling in the media. Oh, yeah, of course. In a way, it has been, and it has been for a long time. Right. So, so this means that if, if the grassroots movement of our students who will go out into the world and be examples for younger kids to instill this love of music, if, if we don't encourage that, then you know we're going to face self extinction. So I don't, remember, I don't remember to whom I said this, but literally the other day I was saying, you know, for all that the the audience is talked about as shrinking and getting older and so forth, conservatories put out more and more graduates every year. So people are making contact with music. People are falling in love with music sufficiently to want to devote their lives to it. Yes. So it's not an un desired or unknown product, yeah? No, not at all. In fact, I, I don't know if you remember, and I wish I would have exact, the exact date and name, but I will dig it up. About 10 to maybe 12 years ago, there was a huge article in the New York Times that pointed out just what you said, that this is actually kind of a golden age for classical music because never before were there so many concerts, so many concert halls, so many festivals, and so much money put into classical music and so many donations. Um, so, okay, that's great. That's the great news. So we need to continue I, to do this. We need I to think what I think what you just said about, how, you know, our job as educators is different now than um, it was 10, 15 years ago, let alone 2025, the, the notion that all you have to do is teach someone to play the violin um, has been, re I think you're absolutely right, has been replaced by the fact that you can take somebody who is perhaps not, um, you know, superstar violinist material, but loves music, has a, a real understanding of it, uh, and show them additional paths where they can bring something to our world that no one else could. Absolutely. And universities actually are the perfect place for that because some of my undergrad students, maybe they'll become doctors. Well, these these will be our audience. Those doctors members. will be the sponsors of their of their Exactly. Seniors. Maybe they're gonna be violin collectors. My my God, how many doctors do you and I know that have huge collections of violins or scientists in general? There seems to be a love um mathematicians the that has endowed my chair at the university is um you know uh, went to uh, law school but has a string quartet so so there there's that connection between us and it's the world the number of lawyers and doctors orchestras in any large city you know what what parents and students should know those are those are the people that went to conservatory and then decided you know i love music but i don't want the uncertainty or i love music but i i'm uh, you know, not uh, strong enough to, you know, to deal with the, the emotional uh, challenges uh, of pursuing a full-time musical career. So I'm going to, as a doctor friend once put it, I'm going to use my medical practice to support my musical habit. Right. So our, our mission as educators is to really encourage the, instill the love of music. And, and encourage people to go as far as they can with it, as far as their you know, desire and capa you know, um, capacity, uh, potential uh, can, can, you know, can yeah. lead them to. And, and, and to perhaps open some, some uh, doors and some, some vistas that they may not have considered. Exactly. And, and this does happen, I think, in, in those one-to-one -one lessons because the instrument teacher really it becomes a musical parent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many times during a semester did you feel that, hmm, okay, so there will be that lesson when we're going to talk more than we're going to play because we need to. I mean, I'd rather, you know, have the student play, but 
at some point you need to you need to have that um you know soul to soul talk and those are actually the moments when you understand more about your student and and if you're a teacher who has a little bit of an open mind you you might realize oh you know maybe if i steer this person towards this avenue um very often i um i i, I teach advanced string pedagogy i obviously don't don't really teach classes but the, the advanced string pedagogy is a doctoral um class in which basically we sit and chat about teaching i mean my god this is like you know a bunch of ner nerdy people talking about teaching oh, sure. uh, violin viola <laughs> and cello so it's great and mm, the assignment for the final paper i always leave it blank i give them the way that you know they say in europe carte blanche to choose their subject and i always get frightened stares can you give us more guns no, no. So why, why do I do that? That is my chance to really see where, where they are, what, what draws them. Uh, when, I, when I did a doctoral degree at, at, the, at the New England Conservatory, one of our seminar professors used to say, what's your beef? What is your beef? What, what? <laughs> and many, many years later, when I invited that professor for the debut of my Four Strings Around the World recital, guess what his line was in the, in the email? Irina, what took you so long? And to me, that was kind of startling. I'm like, what do you mean what took me so long? Like, wait a second, this is an idea I just had three years ago, or no, not three months ago. Um, but then I realized, wait a second, he did That's what that he was too. trying to tell you then. He had figured out that somehow my what my interests were, even before I figure out my what my interests were. So that's kind of the card I'm playing with my, you know, especially my doctoral students to see, you know, what what will that subject be? One of my one of them did a paper on how social media changed um, the world of pedagogy. And I was convinced that he was going to talk about Facebook. Well, you're gonna you're not gonna believe this, but he talked about Instagram, which no, I, I was. I have to say, I some some of my younger know students about in terms of to me. using it for for a stu studio, um, but so right then and there, it was very clear that this person will do certain things, as, at least in his um, uh, pedagogical career. One student wrote a huge paper on statistics on how playing an instrument affects um, us, um, kids in school. And after he gave us a, the presentation, I point blank asked him, I, okay, so are you ready to present this in Congress one day? So a lot of interesting things come out of these papers. And I'm it's hoping that yeah. students, little by little, will realize that that's where their heart is. It's very, very important to, to do what you're passionate about. How, how long do you give them to write those papers, by the way? Um, not, not too long, a few weeks. A few weeks, okay. Yeah. And no, they but don't absolutely. Long, but that's you're, important. you're forcing them, you're forcing them to have that conversation not with you, but with themselves. With themselves. Yes. Yeah. I, I think something about numbers. I like numbers. What am I going to do about numbers and statistics and education and oh my God? Yeah. Yeah. Or I like I really like I really use social media with my students. Oh, wait a second, maybe I can I can write my paper on that. So here there's, we are. There's, I, I think, yeah, there's a, a brave new world forming. Um, I, I, again, totally agree with you. The, the internet's change um, was not the end of it. Um, and I'm pretty sure that Corona is not the end of it either. No. Uh, but certainly we are experiencing as an industry uh, a systemic upheaval. We, we use words like fundamental and systemic a lot, but really it, it, it is a rethinking from the ground up of the role that music will play in the 21st century and how we are going to enable it to play that role. When you were saying earlier about, you know, doctors and, uh, and lawyers uh, 
uh, and I was talking about the orchestras. I was remembering actually a line from um, Dead Poets Society. Did you ever see that movie? No. Um, English teacher, inspirational English teacher at a boarding school, 1950s, but uh, played by Robin Williams. But he says, uh, medicine, law, architecture, these are all noble professions that we make life possible. But poetry, romance, beauty, these are what make life worth living. Well, so it's there. There is okay. Fine, you know we, we've built a better and healthier world with all this time and, and uh, advantage that we have given ourselves. What are we going to do with it to enjoy existing? And how are, how can you enjoy existing without some form of aesthetics for us? Music for somebody else? I don't know. Painting, dance, something. There is a very. Um interesting speech that Karl Polnack, who was then back then the dean of uh, the Boston Conservatory gave to the incoming freshmen. And it went viral. It's very easy if you if you just... Um, How do you spell Polnack? Polnack, P-A-U-L-N-A-C-K. If you just write Polnack Boston Conservatory speech, it'll come right out. In which he made the point that many parents whose kids go to a conservatory or into a, a, a music degree worry about, you know, how- How is my child going to make a living? How is, will they make a living? But also, how is that really, you know, useful to the society? And of course, he made the point that, of course, <laughs> you have you ever been to a wedding where there was no music? Or how would you imagine grieving without music? Or if a you- the happiest moment of your life, you know, they're usually attached to a piece of music. You know, if you listen to music that you played in your youth, you immediately get that jolt of, of youthfulness, of, of energy, because it brings back so much. Um, you go back in time. Uh, but then, but then he, he said something that's so powerful. He said, you know, if you would be an emergency room doctor, one night someone will come with you to you with, you know, having a heart attack. You, you, you must have read, read this section I've read, but I've not seen, please. And, and, you know, if you're prepared as a, as a doctor, you will save that person's life. But think of this, maybe someone one day will come to the concert hall with a broken heart and a broken soul. And it might be up to you to uplift their I, I don't, you know, maybe it's not a, a, a perfect quote. It's not, it's not word for word, but that's exactly what, it. But it might be up to you and you should be ready. It might be up to you to save their soul. The, that evening listening, you know, to you on stage might make a life of a difference for that person. So there's that, you know, hoping that maybe if you, if you do that for one person in your audience for every concert, my God, wow, no, the, that really is worth looking. <laughs> the, the feeling that, um, you know, you, you have made an impact on a life, uh, it, just because it's not measurable necessarily in a number, heart rate, uh, you know, improved test score, um, it doesn't mean that it's not measurable. It doesn't mean that there aren't pass along effects. Um, and going back to what we were talking about earlier, that one moment when you are standing on stage and making that difference, that one moment is made possible by how many different hands and hearts and brains and wallets and you know hours and so forth. The, the hall has to be maintained, the concert has to be announced, the, the orchestra has to be paid, the tickets have to be sold. You know, the, there are so many different facets to that one perfect moment where you have the performance of the Beethoven that you've always wanted to give. And of course, everyone is saying, well, what now? Because now there are no concerts. So what happens? <laughs> well, for example, you and I might not have had the time to talk right now because, you know, we might we'd be, might we'd be off out, playing or out you know, doing our jobs, traveling and, and performing a concert. Um, portals to the world have opened. Um, portals to audiences, don't you think? Portals to the, the audience. A lot of... Uh, audience may members who would have maybe not liked to drive in the dark downtown where there's no parking 
uh, or where you know the Kennedy Center charges twenty three dollars for parking. <laughs> I will park across the street. <laughs> you have to tell me with, where. With spot zero. <laughs> Tell me where afterwards. Don't tell them because I want that parking spot. Yeah, go on. But uh, concerts, you know, are, are usually late. I mean, God, yeah. eight o'clock. I think it will be become my life mission to change eight eight p.m. to maybe six. six. Oh. <laughs> um, Come from work, have a cocktail, have a concert, go to dinner, and digest the concert you just exactly. heard. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so a lot of these audience members are actually watching concerts um being I don't remember which uh, maybe you remember the the organization but they posted that you know for one of their early in the corona uh you know new paradigm uh one of their early live streams they expected you know they hoped for an audience of three or four thousand uh and whatever this orchestra was i think it was in california uh had viewership of like in excess of a hundred thousand which they could have never gotten in real never. life never i mean you can't do it in a stadium you can't do it in real life but not only, you know, leaving aside the sort of crass monetization, which don't leave aside, fine. You can monetize those eyeballs. Uh, but even leaving that aside, it means that, to me, that the art form is not irrelevant to people. Souls are still being repaired. Well, in all these months, you know, being at home, can it, could you imagine these months with no music? <laughs> I have been consuming it probably more now than before because oh. I don't know if it's true for you also but as professionals sometimes you know you you, you don't like have to to well you, to go to a, a friend's concert okay because they're a friend not because you're dying to hear you know that particular repertoire um because right now at eight o'clock you don't have the time yeah. but, even if you're dying to hear you might not be able to do it because you're teaching yeah. or you're you're so traveling conflict, you're playing your own so, concert yeah. But now you can consume it on your own schedule. Yeah. You can consume it in the, you know, pieces that you want. Um, you know, you, you don't have to have a, a forty-minute time commitment to a symphony. Go digest one movement. You know, um, I, I think that there's a, a lot of hidden blessings in this forced separation, and you know, the world that is emerging um, can't have emerged yet during the pandemic. I think it is not going to be visible for a couple of years after everyone can walk around without a mask after everyone doesn't have to socially distance because you know there's a vaccine or because the the virus has i don't know burnt itself out somehow um in, in some post-pandemic world whatever lessons we're learning now only then will i think come to uh, come to be used do, do you agree it with will this? Be, it will be different, yes. And it also, I believe it will be even a, a smaller world than it is now. Uh, two weeks ago, I gave a masterclass for an organization called Musicians for the World. Um, it, it has been started by actually a former student of mine from Boston Conservatory, Kelly McGarry. And her partner, who is also a violinist, uh, has a science who is from Peru. And what they're offering is free lessons to kids from underserved countries, such as Peru, Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, well, it turns out <laughs> that this masterclass, there were nine people from Kenya. And when we asked them what time it was there, it turns out that they had watched two hours of a masterclass between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. their time. Just imagine that. Who would... <laughs> Who would do that here? Um, but they that that shows a certain thirst Absolutely. for for you know what what we we have here and we, maybe even we take for granted. I don't know. I don't think we do, but I clearly, don't think, that, I don't think musicians take it for granted. But I do think that the the forces that make a concert possible sometimes think that there's less demand than there really is worldwide, not just demand in your town, but in worldwide. Kenya. Worldwide, exactly. So now the fact that we can really connect with anyone, anywhere, it's so incredibly powerful. And, I, and that I brings wanted, the silver lining in, in all this. I, I, I mean, I had a list of, you know, like reminiscences and topics that I wanted to go over. But um, I think that what we're talking about now touches on each one of these um, areas, your experiences as a competitor, your experiences as a judge. Uh, you know, your 
wise counsel when it comes to uh, you know colleges and conservatories um you know the the, the performer's life uh the compare and contrast does have to be done the the current world the pre-pandemic world and the world in which you grew uh, you know into a, a professional um so i i feel like we are touching on those topics but i do want to ask a few specific questions in this pandemic and post-pandemic world uh, of you as the competition judge, not just the competitor, and of you as the advisor for colleges and conservatories. Because once again, the, the people who are watching this um, are prospective students for Kirov, for other uh, similar academies worldwide, uh, their parents, um, and then the people who you know, may go and consume our product. They may consume a concert without knowing any of what um, underlies the creation of that product. So first, I want to talk about the, the whole college uh, thing as right now is college application season getting into, into gear. Uh, and it's to begin a very by strange asking me, season uh, now because for the again, first time, it's a very strange season because of, because of the, for the first time, everything will be online and the students will not be able to go and visit campuses. Yeah. So, what is your advice, first of all, for the being unable to make that connection and decision in person? My advice is to try to talk as much as possible with the students that are already at that school. Obviously, every school will have a beautiful video, you know, a virtual tour. Every school will have helpful people in the admissions office, and, and we certainly do at the University of Maryland. Um, everyone, um, every school will have faculty members who will be responsive, especially given where we are now, where you cannot really knock at someone's door and ask if you can observe a lesson or if you could take a trial lesson. Um, so really, the unknown here or the, or the things that maybe where you can find the most useful is, information is to talk to, to peers. Um, and if you've gone to a, a summer music festival where you made a few connections, now is the time to use those connections uh, and ask people what their experience is or simply ask uh, faculty members or admissions um, office uh, people at that particular school if you could get in touch with one of their undergrad students because you would, I think you'd be amazed how much information you would get from that person. Oh yeah, I would, I would think that, yeah. you know, it's like a Yelp review, you know, you would, yeah. um, you would be getting the, the insider's view and advance peek into what your life might be there. Um, I think that uh, if someone doesn't have, um, you know, a, a friend from a summer festival who is attending the conservatory or college of their choice, what you just said is is vitally important. You could reach out to the admissions office and see if there are students to whom you know they, they would direct you. Um, but it's it's also very important to point out to students and parents. Whereas before, you were going to spend two months uh, and a whole lot of money flying from wow. town to town, going to colleges in person. Um, and yes, then there's this you know direct view that you have of the institution. You don't have that direct of you now, it's filtered, but you can do all those tours in two or three days. Yeah. And maybe maybe a faculty members will be actually more willing to, to give you that trial lesson because now it's, you know, we don't have that, the, 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 you know, the campus tours and, and that other personal connection. Uh, all, all the auditions are going to be uh, previously uh, videotaped. We talked a little bit about this uh, with you, was it last week or two weeks ago? Oh my God, weeks ago, like days. Um, and trying to make a, a good impression, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to spend a lot of money going to a, into a studio. Just try to play in front of that camera as if you're playing for, for a live audience because really all, all that matters is for people to see the lo your love of music, you know, that you enjoy playing the violin. That's really going to be the most striking thing in an audition. It always is. I was I was going to go there next about you know uh, when you are watching these videos, you know what are you watching for? But let me backtrack uh, first for for the advice to the student in making the videos um, to not let your point just pass by. I want to underscore this: 
you don't have to send the video that you make today. The video that you make today for admission to the University of Maryland is a video that you watch, self-judge, maybe see yourself, uh, you know, to uh, paraphrase Robert Burns, see yourself as others see you, um, and hear yourself as others hear you, and then make another video. You know, you can always use the one that you made yesterday, uh, you know, if, if the one that you make tomorrow is not as good. But you have a golden opportunity you did not have pre-corona to put your, not just your, your you know, best foot forward, to put your informed foot forward, where you know what you sound like. In the best like. life. That's, uh, that's true. It's amazing. I, I mean, that's actually a huge advantage. Uh, and from, for, for would let you know. Well, in competitions, what would I have given <laughs> to be able to say, you know what, that sucked. And that's not me. I'm going to play for you at the way in the practice room two days ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going to send, you know, you know, everybody says this and they're all very surprised when you tell them, yes, this is a common sentiment. It worked, Professor, it worked in the practice room. Yeah, yeah, it worked in the practice room. <laughs> but that's, why you, that's why you never, when you, when you walk the hallways, uh, you never listen to what comes out of the practice room because everyone sounds everyone like... Everyone sounds like hyphens. Yes. <laughs> this. It's mind-boggling. You just walk. I've learned this. <laughs> you just walk. <laughs> I, I remember, again, I shouldn't mention names, but I remember standing with somebody who's a very well-established, uh, you know, concertmaster for major symphony orchestra right now. Um, backstage, uh, both of us were finalists in this competition, and the person who ended up winning the competition was, uh, was practicing. We're all in the finals at this point. We're all nervous. Uh, at that point, I still smoked. You know, I'm... I'm Chain smoking. He's chain smoking. <laughs> We're trying to tell stupid jokes. We're trying to like be super cool. Of course. Yeah. You know, and at one point he just puts down his cigarette. He goes, God damn it. Can she not play one note out of tune? I know. It's scary. Yeah. It's scary. But, you know, also the reason why we did those competitions is that at, actually at that young age, no matter how critical you are of yourself, you're still. You, you do have a little bit of the youth um, daring innocence. You don't think too much about things. You just do them. Kind of yeah. the way we learned how to play an instrument. In the there beginning, was, you don't analyze yeah, there, what there was definitely. Oh, you're doing. I was just going to say, there was definitely an advantage to not knowing how difficult the thing that you were doing is. Um, my very first, you know, master class for a famous person was when I was 10 years old and I played. Oh, shoot. Can you hear I me? I lost you for a second. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. There you um, go. I, I was saying that uh, my first master class yeah. where I played for, you know, the superstar, when I was 10 years old, I played for Isaac Stern in a public master class. And one of the things he says, I remember now, he said, you will understand how difficult violin playing is in about 20 years. Yep. And, you know, I thought 20 years from now, you know, you might as well be talking about a million years from now. Uh, I, I didn't have any clue what he was talking about when I was 10. When I was 30, I, I went, oh, right, okay. That's right. right. Yeah. Well, Menuhin realized how difficult violin, violin playing was in his 20s, but he had started really early. <laughs> yeah. Back before he realized, he was a prodigy. <laughs> you know the the old Russian saying that everyone knew that it was impossible to play this well, except the idiot. So since he didn't know it was impossible, he played that well. You know, we we all do things that now we you look back on it and you you're like, oh, your eyes are rolling. Like, what was I thinking? I mean, everyone seems to have a story for this podcast, so I decided to tell mine. I've never made this story public. Um, Andrew Haveron has his uh, going into first round of the Queen Elizabeth competition drunk, which of course it's it's a it's a it's a or an urban myth. It was not true, but um, so I can so vouch for that, by the way. I can vouch for that. I was there. He was not drunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, <laughs> no, of course not. No, no one would do that. I I don't think. Um, I mean, that's pretty much suicide right there. Um, so I what I did. A Montreal competition, and that that was maybe I, I cannot say it was my my first major competition. It wasn't, but anyway, it doesn't matter what I was thinking. Clearly, I wasn't thinking. 
I was convinced that I was not going to make the semifinal. So I never bothered to learn the imposed piece, which of course was a Canadian piece because it usually is from the country of, you know, where the competition is. Guess what happened? I did make the semifinal. So how here long did you have, how long did you have to learn the piece? I think about 48 hours. By memory, right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, I but I, some, I had, some I had, had very computational memory. Memorization is never a problem, was, or at least and back then it was, I, I, I almost have photographic memory, which is good and bad. Good because you can learn things very fast. Bad because ask me two weeks later, I don't even know how the piece starts. Um, it's, it's the way it is. There's always an advantage and a disadvantage. So I had made the same final and I didn't know the imposed piece. And of course I started learning the piece and I was very lucky that um, an Apperson who was there with, a, with someone else, she was there with Subin Kim. She was, she took pity on me. I don't know why. She, and said, okay, she was not even, you know, she was not the person that was supposed to play with me. I had someone else from the competition, but she took pity on me. She said, okay, listen, do you want to rehearse for half an hour? I, I have half an hour. Come, just come in. I'll, I'll play with you. I'll always be grateful to her. I don't, I should reach out to her because I don't even know if she remembers this story. Anyway, so I had one rehearsal with her. I had one other rehearsal with the pianist from the competition. And then I had it was my turn to play in the semifinal. And I, I put this piece first because I figured whatever happened. Yeah. So I played it. And at the prize ceremony, there was a prize, of course, for the best interpretation of the obligatory obligatory post piece. And guess who won that prize? For freshness. Because so, was... so I, I, I hesitate to say this story because then, of course, you know, what exactly what the lesson that my students would learn from this? I guess, you know, you <laughs> that you should do crazy things. Not no, really. But sometimes, but sometimes I... because you haven't burdened yourself with all of the baggage, your performance is, all joking aside, the freshest. It was probably, yes, it probably did not have any tension, no, you know, overthinking. I just played the piece the best I could with, you know, the most amount of musicality, and it probably came out really well. Would I advise anyone to do this? Oh, God, no. Of course not. Would I, am I, you know, slapping myself for having even the, you know, the whatever, the courage to do that? It's insane. But... It, it does show that actually I was probably, maybe here's the lesson, I was probably ready to do this. You were but ready to. In this, in this business, you know, it's not, you'd never get lucky. It's not like, you know, you get a call from a conductor that, you know, is asking you if you can replace someone in a week to play this concerto and you're, you're going to say, oh my God, I'm so lucky. Well, you're lucky only if you're ready to replace that soloist and play the Brahms concerto in a week or, or Tchaikovsky concerto. So I guess I was actually ready at that point in my career to learn a piece in two days because I was probably, I, you know, I had not only practiced so much before that, and it was in good shape and my brain was in a good shape and I could focus in such a way that I could do it. But I had enough repertoire by that point. And that's something maybe we should talk about because it's important for young people to know that uh, it was not daunting and incapacitating for me to learn. The, the uh, actual mechanics of learning yeah. a new piece is something that you had practiced. You hadn't practiced this specific piece. Yeah. But the general so, concept. I was not. Yes, I was. I was a little lucky, uh, but I was also curiosity, ready to the, do it. the Montreal was before the Queen Elizabeth. Yes, it was. Yeah. So we should also point out that in the Queen Elizabeth, that experience in Montreal must have served you in good stead, because in the finals, again for the parents and students who don't know, 
in the finals of the Queen Elizabeth, they give you a piece. The finals last about a week. They give you a piece. You have one week. You have one week to learn a major work with orchestra, I might add, um, where you are cut off from the world. You do not have uh, your professor on speed dial. You are not allowed contact with anyone. Uh, you can practice as much or as little as you want, but you are um, sequestered. And the whole point is to find out how well you will play something, how well you will learn something that, that you don't have in your ear exactly. because there aren't any recordings. You, you know, I remember I came in to sign some paperwork after the semifinals and the piece was lying on the table and they were like, no, 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 you, you cannot, you cannot look around. At it. I couldn't even glance at the, the manuscript, you know. It, I ended up memorizing, it was a pretty gnarly piece and I ended up it memorizing was. it. Because I like playing things from memory, it's easier for me. And apparently no one else had played it from memory. So when they took the stand, I heard in the audience a gasp. And I almost, I almost said, no, 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 put it back. And I thought, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I, I have a plan, I'm just gonna- Of, all, of all the things that I wish I could learn from you, that ability to memorize would be top of the list because every time that I walk out on stage and I am nervous, the one like first, second, third thing that I'm nervous about is memory, memory, memory. Well, I mean, there's there's many ways to memorize, and and I've I've had that discussion with 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 my students. There's oral memory; you will remember how a piece sounds. There's muscle memory; you remember how a piece feels. Uh, that's how most young kids learn. There's visual memory, and then there's logical memory. How many times did people ask you after a concert, how is it possible that you learned all those notes? And I don't know what you say, but I always say, well, okay, just think about this. Music is a language. Now, if I would ask you to memorize a poem in, say, Japanese, um, you would eventually memorize it, but you would have no clue, unless you speak Japanese, of course, what you're saying. Now, if I would give you a poem in English and ask you to memorize it, you would memorize it. It would be not too difficult. Why? Because you understand what that poem the, is the about. Words. Semantics. It's the same thing with, with music. We are not memorizing notes, which would be the equivalent of memorizing words in a language you don't... Syllable by syllable of, you know, stuff that sounds like... That, that is we Georgia. memorize the logic of the music. To us, music is a story. It has sentences, it has phrases, it has, you know, uh, a drama attached to it. It has an arch, it has a climax. So it's not about memorizing notes, which would be impossible, of course. Like if you would have to memorize notes by you would never be able to do that. But you memorize the logic of the music. So then all of a sudden, it's very, very different. So to that, of course, you attach all the other types of memory, the oral memory, the muscle memory, which is the one that's the least dependable. Yeah. The one that's most likely to go wrong. I can, I can speak to that personally uh, at a competition where the finger memory worked, but starting on the wrong string. So yeah. my memory slip began because I started a fifth off of where I should have been. That cost me a first prize and I, I dropped a second. So, so, so it's, it's, that's why, you know, people should not make that the primary way of uh, memorizing something. But I think for me, the logic of the music should be the primary way to memorize something. And the most reliable. Yeah. But and uh, most right there, again, I, I want to, for, for viewers, I, I would like to underscore something. The reason for all of the classes that uh, Professor Bursanu mentioned at the beginning uh, at the conservatory in Romania, the, the reason for theory, the reason for um, uh, oral training, be, be it called solfege or ear training, uh, the reason for aesthetics, the reason for music history, <clears throat> the reason for analysis is, it's not just to memorize, but it's so that the stuff that you play is not, if you are American, a, sentence, a poem in Japanese. It is a poem in English. Um, it, it is so that the thing that you are trying to make make sense to the listeners first makes sense to you. So yes, practice room time, super important, uh, but equally important time in the, uh, in the study hall. And my secret weapon, if we can call it this way, etudes. 
Interesting. Why? Should we, should we open that can of worms? It's not a can of worms. It's, it's not a can, can of worms. Fireflies, actually. Um, I believe that my ability to learn pieces so quickly, uh, or even to memorize, even though, of course, we do not memorize etudes, but, but sight ringing was made on etudes. I was fortunate enough that that in my training, my teachers gave me lots and lots and lots of etudes, you know. I started with learning positions with the sit etudes and then went to Kaiser and then went to Fiorillo and... Wait, you went from Kaiser to Fiorillo? There must have been something in between. There had to I think be. There was Clank. Um, there must have been some other, uh, maybe Easy Mazas, Easy Dunkla. Yeah, the, the maybe probably Easy Dunkla, Opus 84, yes. Um, because now I realize how I always thought Fiorillo was something very easy until like now I'm <laughs> we have actually a Fiorillo project for, in my studio and I'm you know I'm practicing them as well because hey why not um, and I'm thinking wow these are really hard some of them actually are harder than the road etudes but yes. oh God did I ingest etudes I I ate, I ate them with how many breakfast how many per week one at least one just, just one. At least I, with my students, I try to basically do it rolling. So at any sometimes time, you do it two or well, three. Yeah, if you so if you do Rod and Kreuzer at the same time, you can do two. If you yeah. do Gavigny and Don, you can do one of each. Or or uh, etudes addressing different uh, technical exactly. Things. But the etudes that you assign this week is due in one week. The etude that you right. assign next week is due the week right. after. But in in between, they're working on two etudes at the same time. So so there's so much coming yeah. out of etudes. I, I cannot really, like, I cannot emphasize the importance that I believe Etudes did for me. I mean, I, I pretty much could side read any, I don't think I have ever practiced orchestra music. And people always make a big face, but, but I didn't need to, because if you are able to play Etudes, orchestra music, I mean, okay, noodling a passage 10 minutes before the rehearsal starts, that's not really practicing, that's just like looking at it. So, yeah. So that's what they will no, the, the The thing that every great sight reader that I've ever talked to has always, you know, they've said different things, look ahead, this, that, but all of them will always repeat. You get good at sight reading by sight reading. And yes. what you were effectively practicing was your ability yes. to sight read the piece and learn the piece, to imprint what you've sight read. And you'll see that actually people from, from you know, the top tier orchestras, they can sight read anything. Why? Because they do this. <laughs> day in and day out. I haven't really side read anything in many, many, many years. And it's, it's especially something that especially actually in talking to in talking to uh, Igor Yusufovich and talking to Andrew Havron here, they made the points that uh, in London, especially, there are the orchestras where I think Igor made this point that it was uh, you know months before he played like a familiar Brahms symphony that you know every single program was you know new stuff. Um, which not, not only forces you, of course, to sight read in the rehearsal, but also if, if in the first rehearsal there's something you don't know, you better be absolutely positive that in the second rehearsal you it's know it. It's ready. Oh, yeah. It's a little bit like chamber music. I mean, we've all gone to um, summer music festivals or even, you know... Uh, um, Newport. Oh, my goodness. Newport Festival. Do you want to tell people what that's like? <laughs> I, I got a stack. My first year at Newport, I got a stack. 16 pieces. And yep. um, Malkovich Sr., the, the late Malkovich, called me and said, oh, so you'll be playing first violin in the Dvorak string, uh, in the Dvorak piano quintet. And I said, yes, because, you know, Dvorak piano quintet. So, no, not yeah. that one. <laughs> it, it turned out there was an earlier, also a major, Dvorak piano quintet. So out of those 16 pieces, I had not seen a single one of them. Newport, to me, is a great example of what you can do if you choose your musicians wisely and if they have the right chemistry. So here's how, here's, here's how it goes. Uh, probably also when you, when you, you, when you were there, um, they had three concerts a day, if not four. Yeah, five, I think. Okay, there you go. So you might play in two concerts every day and you in between you might have another two or three rehearsals. For each piece, you would get one full rehearsal and then one half rehearsal just so that right before the concert, just so that you remember how it how goes, goes what, today. who you're playing with. Yeah. And then you get thrown on stage. So so this is sounds like an insane formula. Who who can do that? Well, again, if you choose your musicians wisely and if they really are willing to go there, 
magical things have happened in Utah. Oh, yeah. Where uh -huh. the electricity in the air and on stage, because it, you go to the, the place where you don't even have time to get nervous, but you have to have complete and absolute trust in your colleagues. And that's where magic happens because you, there's that in, immeasurable bonding on stage. I had never felt that anywhere before. You know, well, first, we're, we're, one usually that, we're, we're used to play with. We're, we're playing with uh, the, the usual pianist, uh, you know, if you have a, a chamber group, you're playing with your usual collaborators. Of course. Um, and the, the flip side of that coin is also that you might feel their moods. They, they had a bad day that morning. You feel it. You walk out on stage, you're, you're feeling something's askew. But you walk out with people you haven't played with before. You are paying attention to everything that they do on stage in a way that you've never paid attention before. And you depend on them. Everything depends on them Absolutely. at that that point so i i love i mean i i call i call new newport uh festival the summer camp i never had um because it's exhilarating it's a, to walk in and out of of that um so, so you know like actually, you literally get thrown in the ocean and you have to you know the, the learning experience for for those of us foolish enough to think that we're done learning we're not done learning no no you never are <laughs> funny, so funny you should mention amazing. it's the summer camp. Malkovich actually um, said to me the first time that I, that I went there, he said, I want you to think of this like as a summer camp. You're going to be living in a dorm with the other musicians, you know, and maybe you've met some of them before. Probably you haven't. You know, it, it was definitely a feeling of throwback. And, and the, the unwinding after the concerts on the porch of the, uh, you know, the, the dorm house. We should also tell the audience that the dorm is an, an incredible mansion, which is uh, right across the street from the Breakers, which happens to be the biggest mansion in Newport. So it's actually quite a luxurious um, summer camp feeling where everything is taken care of because musicians, all they have to do is to show up in for a sure and the, you know, everything else is taken care of the food, the driving to the mansions. Um, and, and, and anyway, the bonds with the audience members who come there, especially um, every summer, they, they book a hotel and they're there and they're in the first row listening and smiling. It's, it's quite, quite incredible. I mean, that, of course, that's, those are the things that we miss right yes, now. The, the pers lot. That personal connection. Yeah. Yes. But and this is also a, a, a way to enforce the, the, the grassroots movement, so to speak, and, and to, to ensure that, you know, I, I've learned how to make my own newsletter. Um, why? So first of all, you know, to keep in touch with my, you know, my friends, people in, in the network. Uh, second of all, because of course I couldn't afford to have a PR person anymore because I haven't had any, any income from concerts in what? Is it eight months now? It's been eight months. But that actually gave me the chance to make everything more personal. And and to realize, first of all, who is on that on the mailing list? I had not I had not glanced at that in probably many 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 years, but now it's it, I I feel closer in many ways to to the people in my network because of that. Um, doing things, of course, as a Pro Music Foundation artist, I that requires every artist to play two community concerts for each public concert. I had done many many community concerts. I've played, you know, in, in, in hospices, in retirement places, in, um, in Hong Kong, I played a school for uh, kids with mental disabilities, uh, you know, in, in places where music really, really matters and makes a difference is that, you know, one, one, one day someone with a broken heart will walk in the concert hall and you will make a difference. So I've had that feeling. I know I know it, the music really does make a difference. Um, but nonetheless, this, this time was, was different when musicians really felt like they had to step up. Um, in Boston, there was this wonderful uh, series called Notes of Hope, which went on for a month. And every night there was a different musician playing as a way of thanking people in the healthcare community in Boston. 
and at the at the very end of the of the video which was you know a little performance uh with an, a verbal introduction by the artist at the at the very end you will have the little zoom squares where the musicians were clapping and that is so you, you know you you can you can look at it uh no notes of hope you just notes of hope. notes of hope all the videos are there actually the last performance was yo yo ma and it's so moving you know all these musicians uh clapping for people in the, in the medical field uh it it was you know kind of a great thing and very important to feel like you know i have to do this I, I was there, uh, you know, doing something solo, and I was there with the Boston Trio, my my ensemble, and and this feeling continues to to you know we all we've all done um, our fair share of videos for various um, endeavors, either festivals or other charities and so on. Um, I uh, in my chamber music class at uh, the U University of Maryland, it, was, it became clear even before school started that people were not going to be able to rehearse in person or very little. In fact, that was the case. We had about two weeks from the moment when we were allowed and the moment when we were sh shut down again, which was this this Monday, um, November 16th. No, I, yeah, it was, a, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, there was very little time for people to actually rehearse. However, in this uh, chamber music class, because we realized that the goal was to have video recordings of the movements of, or, of the pieces that people were playing in small piano ensembles, um, we also thought it would be helpful to the students to feel like their music is shared with someone that they have a goal for making this project. That it's not Why, just after all, are they something for a grade. That, yeah. you know, um, and many of the topics in the class were addressing big questions such as how can we stay relevant as musicians? Um, what is the musician's role? You know, is a musician a social uh, justice force? We don't have all the answers, but you know, I felt it was important to ask these questions and, and yeah. talk about them. So we are now three weeks before uh, the semester will end and the groups in this class called Meaning Meaningful Connections, kind of has a nice name, uh, will share their, their projects of their chamber music piece with Music for Autism, with Ayuda, which is a refugee outfit. It turns out that one of my neighbors worked for this, uh, and I, I realized she did, and then I contacted them. So the the uh, the duo that will be providing um, a video uh, of the of the piece, um, it's it's Rebecca Clark Morpheus for viola and piano, and it turns out that the violist mother is a Vietnamese refugee. And so he just wrote wrote to me uh, last week after I put him in touch with Ayuda, and he said, "I have have never thought when I took this class in the beginning this, of the semester that this will become so meaningful for me and my family. That now I can do something to for give to give back. And yeah. this video will be used for their annual fundraising. Now, I was going to yeah. ask the the videos are they are they live streamed? Are they used?" For, for the organization's internal use? How, how are they used? Um, I, it, well, in, in the case of, of Music for Autism, it will be live streamed for their particular community of you know kids with autism. Uh, I believe it's probably a public concert, so anyone could watch it. Um, they have a particular format, and our students will, will you know have a, a formal training in what that format is. Uh, for Ayuda, it will be sent, uh, I assume, to the people in their network. I, I, maybe at some point it will be public on their website. But yeah. these things have taken a turn that you know even <laughs> me and my colleague Rita Sloan, who is the uh, um, director of uh, uh, collaborative studies, and she's a pianist. We have this class together because we felt it was necessary. If you have a piano ensemble, to have a member of the strings and the member, yes, exactly. Of the piano, vice versa. Right. <laughs> so um, it it has turned out into something that you know even uh, we didn't foresee that it would become so. Um, it makes it has a huge impact, 
And at the end of the semester, I know that our students will feel that there is something there they can pursue. Well, the, going like making full circle here, uh, this is not just about a, a good performance or a great performance. This is, uh, you know, about the, the role um, of a, a player um, and the network that the player relies upon in, in a larger world. Um, they're not doing it for a grade. They're not even doing it for a performance, uh, but they are doing it for um, a kind of social ecosystem. Absolutely. So, so, so all of a sudden we are proving that music, being a musician, is not only, you know, an entertainment category. Uh, no, way, no, it's on, on, it on your track. <laughs> it is definitely a sole, uh, you know, paranormal medical treatment, you might Absolutely. say. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I want to, um, if there are any questions, I want to leave some time for those. Um, there are sometimes aren't very many, but uh, let's see. There are none uh, currently. If anyone who is watching now does have questions, um, this is the, the ideal time to have asked them. Um, I think the, the only thing that I haven't uh, really touched upon at all, and uh, it, it feels kind of anticlimactic to touch on it now, but uh, I would like to take advantage of your presence while, while we have it. Um, is the experience now as a, a judge. <clears throat> so we talked a lot about, you know, what it was like to be selected, whether in a competition or for uh, the, the conservatory path in Romania. Now that you're on the other side, what have you learned about the process of selecting? Hmm. Again, it's about what that person has to say. If, if someone walks on the stage and there's life in the music, it's always compelling. Um, no one, no one on any jury will want to be the note police. Because, first of all, I... You, you feel that. stupid in front of your colleagues, right? Yeah, we are not, we are not accountants of notes, are we? That's not why we're playing our instrument. Uh, to, you know, have a nice little check after each note that we got. Who cares, really? Um, and and who, who said that? Um, a great performer that I cannot wait to make my first mistake on stage because after that I'm, I'm free. You know, it, because mistakes happen. Everyone has an accident on stage, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, people... People said that actually Hor Horowitz's best concerts were actually after the concert when he started playing his encores. That that was really what people were there for for the for the encores. I mean, obviously you, you take it with a grain of salt. I mean, I think any pianist would want to play the way Horowitz played in any concert. Um, yes, but exactly the way you know any violinist would want to play the way. No, but it's when it's when they work. metaphorically loosen their tie. It's when they metaphorically loosen their tie and, and you know become unbuttoned and suddenly you are a party. Uh, allowed access to a part uh, of their soul you're not usually allowed. So 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 it's it's not really about as I said a rigid um, sort of computer type of counting in which you get penalized for mistakes it's more about what you bring to the table as a musician will will yeah. actually once you're on the other side will you be able to play in a meaningful way for your audiences that's but what do, do you find that now do, do you find that now um you know after having judged uh, competitions uh, auditions and so forth do you find that now you look back on your younger self um, who had perhaps a different set of priorities um, with like, don't you wish you could go back and have a chat with yourself? I don't even know how I played back then. <laughs> I'm not even sure I would want to listen to anything. Uh, maybe it was I once listened to Last Movement of the Ravel Sonata. Uh, in Queen Elizabeth, and I thought, my God, back then I could really play the violin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then there's times when I feel, my God, if I could have only played this Bach, the 
then back then that or I, I would have understood Bach the the way I understand it now. Right. Or if I had this vision about my repertoire back then, you know, maybe it doesn't really matter. I mean, you should be who you are at that age. Uh, choose your you choose your repertoire wisely. Make it make sure it does represent you. Actually, that's that's a point that that's worth uh, making. Um, it's it's important to put yourself like like we were talking about college auditions in the best possible light. You know, if there's a right. passion for print that maybe you don't think it's as impressive on paper, but you play better than the other one who you know is. I mean, it's still a pagan in Caprice. Who cares? You know, if you if you play what you play best and with most gusto, and that's what will be most successful. Yeah, I, I think the the repertoire selection, um, playing to your strengths. Um, I mean, I believe that you still have to take into account the fact that if you play the world's best accolade concerto, I'm sorry, it's still the accolade concerto. It's not right. You know, th th there's there are levels that are understood to be present in what, what you're saying. Um, there are, there's only so well that you can play the Vivaldi A minor concerto. Um, that said, everything that you play should show, first of all, that uh, you command the instrument and equally, first of all, equally, first of all, that you genuinely love music, that you're not being you know, forced at gunpoint to record this program for the audition to the University of Maryland. Absolutely. You are doing it because your dream is to give your life over to notes. And it, we sometimes, you know, the individual touches um, happen also when you play your um, 20th century or 21st century piece. You know, the, the, you have you have a choice, and it's it. You do see a lot of people's personality depending on what they choose. Well, yeah, the <laughs> to match your story about. Uh, not having learned the obligatory piece um, and what that said both about you and your, like if somebody had known that on the jury, I would think that that would be equally illustrative. Not only did she just learn this piece in two days and what does that tell you about this, this woman's, you know, ability to play the violin, but also what does it tell you about her, um, you know, view of herself and of the future that she came in, played and thought, well, that's it. I'm not, I'm not going to the second round, you know, um, I, I wanted to match that story. I'll, I can wrap with this story. A mutual friend of ours um, who, well, he, he probably will not hate me for telling this story, so I'll mention him by name. I might Ford know. Yeah, yes, I knew exactly who that was going to be. <laughs> did, did he tell you about his uh, Chrysler competition win? I know he won the Chrysler competition. I know he won with Sibelius, if I'm not yes. wrong. Yes. But what you may not know is that Florin, and what our listeners don't know, is that Florin is the sweetest man in the world and sometimes a little bit absent-minded. So he showed up at the hall for the final round uh, and the final round of the Chrysler is in two parts. Six finalists play their concerto with piano. The top three are then selected to play their concerto with orchestra. So Florin showed up to play his concerto with piano uh, and he was under the impression that it's a rehearsal. And when he saw the television cameras and the full hall, he thought, oh, these Viennese people really love music. How nice. <laughs> and he started playing the Sibelius. And he said, you know, when you get to the bottom of like the first paragraph, right before then, he wanted to stop and go back because he felt that the tempo was not quite. And he thought to himself, I want to go back, but these people, they don't want to listen to the, the rehearsal work. Let, I'll, I'll go to the end and then we'll come back and, and work. And he gets to the end still under the impression that it's a rehearsal and the audience applauds and the pianist basically leads them off stage. And he's utterly confused. And he's utterly confused. And, and uh, the pianist says, and now we wait. And he says, wait for what? And the pianist says, the results. He goes, what results? That is so funny. But would he have played the same relaxed, utterly masterful, you know, Sibelius, if he had known that this was this was it, this was for real? I think the moral of yours, the moral of your story, and the moral of that story is, it 
we really do need to know what we're doing. But sometimes you can consider yourself lucky when you don't. And you have to be ready. <laughs> but you have to be ready. <laughs> only, yeah. all the, all, only ready people are lucky. <laughs> exactly. The more you practice, I'm sure the luckier you will be. Yeah. Yay. That's very inspiring to, to practice. In fact, I have to say, I've just played my first concert this, this last week. Um, and I played a piece that I hadn't played for many, many years. Uh, don't ask me why. Well, actually, I know why, because the recital is, uh, which is something we did a lot when we grew up, is a dying species. Um, there, it's not by chance that in both institutions in which I taught, Boston Conservatory and the University of Maryland, the first thing I did when I started teaching was to start a recital series because I feel that recital series, as opposed to chamber music series, recital series show someone at their best. Um, if there's so much to show in a recital, you know, if any, any violinist will play masterfully a concerto, but it's really in recitals that you get to know the personality of a violinist or a cellist or a violist. Um, so, so at Boston Conservatory, I started the uh, String Master Series, and when I came at the Univers University of Maryland, I started, I know it's a little funny, the Masterful Strings <laughs> Series. <laughs> But they're both, master and strings are fine. You're fine. Right. But they're both recital series because I find that this is what's what's lacking from the, the scene these days. You hear very, very few recitals. So going back to my story, I hadn't because I hadn't, you know, I have not played a, a, a recital in, you know, a while. You just don't rarely get hired to play a recital. This is why I started my own solo violin recital, because I got tired of not being hired you know, while being hard to play concertis with orchestras and in summer music festivals and, you know, a lot. Um, but the recital is a dying species. So I am um, playing the Rondo Capriccioso, Sansons Rondo Capriccioso after so many years was so exhilarating. And it really got me practicing the way I had. I don't think I've practiced like this since I was in high school because I finally had time to practice. Every time you would, you know, I don't have, I would have half an hour, you would find me with the violin in my hand. Um, such a wonderful time to, for self-reflection a little bit. For and, and it's such a different experience to come back to something you knew. And then yeah. you re-examine it right. and you discover things you never knew you knew, discover things you never considered. Yeah. But I it, feel it's... that, you know, now we're, so many of us are ready to go back, you know, maybe we should end with just this. We are ready to take music. When, when music stages ready, huh? Music stage, concert stages back. Yes, when when the universe is ready for the concert to come back, I think the music will come back, uh, and my optimistic self says stronger than before. Absolutely. That's that's a good positive note to to wrap on. Absolutely. Um, so, Irina, thank you, first of all. Thank you for all of your time. Thank you for all of your uh, advice. Uh, there are so many things that I wish we had uh, even more time to talk about that perhaps we can do a part two of this conversation. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> Sounds good. I, I Until would then, be well, you and everyone else. Stay safe and mask up. Absolutely.